The Tom Woods Show, episode 1880. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Our old friend Dan McCarthy, who is editor of the journal Modern Age, which has been around since the late 1950s as a fixture of conservative intellectual thought, just wrote a piece called Dead End for the Left, in which the first sentence reads, progressivism is a dying ideology. And I thought, this is just wishful thinking. <laughs> I have to dig into this one. I'm not sure I buy this. So I'm not actually sure how I'm going to conclude. I'm just going to start talking about this. I have to talk this through. I'd like to believe this is the case. I'm unconvinced, but I'm going to walk through what Dan says in this particular episode. So here we go. Now, we all know, and Dan does not deny, that progressivism is, shall we say, hegemonic, whether it's we're talking about on college campuses or in the media. But he says that this is misleading. He says, look, the Democratic Party has no leaders more appealing than a 78-year-old Joe Biden. He says there is no other Obama on the horizon. And by Obama, I'm not talking about the content of his policies, but the superficial pleasantness of Obama, right? He was well-spoken. He seemed cheerful. People went for his message. They were very much drawn to him. There doesn't seem to be a charismatic up-and-coming figure to follow him. There's nobody in the House or Senate who's youthful, who stands out in this way. And when we think of people like uh, Beto O'Rourke or um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, well, they have their popularity in certain circles, but even AOC, who's much more popular, is certainly too extreme for most people. She appeals very much to the left, but she's not going to be able to generate a successful national campaign. The successful national campaigns by the Democrats have by and large occurred by trying to suppress the AOC message the best they can. And then Dan goes on to say, look, try to imagine how a party could have had more advantages in 2020. You had the COVID-19 fiasco, you had an economic downturn, but that was, of course, caused by the lockdowns, but that didn't matter. They could blame the sitting president for that. They had nonstop, nonstop for four years demonized Trump as uniquely wicked in the pantheon of American presidents. And clearly, if you know American history, he doesn't even scratch the surface in terms of the possibilities of wickedness in the American presidency. It's not even, not even worth talking about. He's nowhere near the worst of the presidents. And yet after all this, after more or less making people afraid to admit they supported him, all these kinds of things, the best they could do, they were not really able to crack Trump's base and the Trump vote. Now, let me read Dan's own words. With a decisive margin in the battleground states amounting to only to some 70,000 votes, it is not hard to imagine that absent COVID and the recession, the incumbent would have prevailed. The clearest lesson of all was that without the demonic caricature of President Trump to drive Democratic turnout in 2018 and last year, the Democrats would have no magnetic pull at all. All right, now let me read just the, the remainder of what he wrote because it, there's not that much. It's worth thinking about. I'm just not sure if it's too clever by half. I'm not sure if it's too optimistic. So we'll think about it. He says, progressivism is exhausted. The radical ideas it promotes today were hatched in gender studies programs and other arcane precincts of the academy 30 or more years ago. Its economic nostrums are even hoarier, or else, like modern monetary theory, they are the mere reductio ad absurdum of Keynesianism and socialism past. The universal basic income is a crackpot panacea with roots extending as far back as Thomas Paine's agrarian justice pamphlet of 1797. Novelty is not a criterion by which conservatives judge the worth of an idea, of course, but thinkers who consider themselves progressive are under pressure to show that there are new vistas toward which they wish to lead the country. Instead, progressivism today is an attempt to turn the racial injustices of the past into a political religion of the future and forevermore. 
Can blaming the Americans alive today for the evils that their ancestors overcame as well as perpetrated really be the basis for a sound psychology, let alone politics, in the 21st century? No, but it can for a time be a shortcut to prominence in the media and in those parts of the business world less moored to reality. As long as interest rates are low and new technologies provide some cover for the dwindling of traditional forms of productivity, the game can go on in corporate America. But when those conditions change, as they already are beginning to, woke capitalism will awake to a far less indulgent competitive environment. And then finally he says, Marxism and even Marxism-Leninism was once a powerfully creative ideology, inspiring intellectuals and activists and generating new views of history and culture, as well as economics and politics. The cultural radicalism of today was once highly creative in its own perverse way as well. But Marxism remained an official dogma of the Soviet state and too much of American higher education, long after it had ceased to be a living idea. Its power was its tomb. And so too is the hegemony that progressivism commands today in our country and throughout the West. If power were wealth, progressivism would be a billionaire miser, wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice, but without heir or legacy. All right, let's unpack this. I'll have the whole thing linked at tomwoods.com slash 1880. There's probably something to this, but here's the problem, I think. Progressivism doesn't have to get its entire program implemented for it nevertheless to do a lot of damage. It could be that the extreme progressivism that we're living through with the critical race theory and all the, the hate and the attempt to divide the country by race and all that, yeah, that may not have a long life. That's possible. But the general thrust of progressivism, the, the general outlook, the view of the state, the view of what the state can do, the view of what the state should do, the nature of the problems that they perceive in society, namely people who are um, stuck to old-fashioned views that they need to be re-educated out of by a progressive elite that we need alleged experts, we need credentialed people, people credentialed by institutions that despise us to run our lives, to, I mean, to, even to tell us when we can open our businesses and to what extent. That doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And that persisted and triumphed throughout the 20th century such that even someone as charismatic as Ronald Reagan really could not do anything about it. He really was not able to slow maybe have slightly slowed the oncoming train. That was about it. The idea of reversing it or changing course is just unthinkable. They don't need to implement the entire Green New Deal if the effect of the Green New Deal is to pull the more moderate left 30% in their direction. Because, of course, the so-called conservatives will wind up going 15% in that direction. And that's the trend of the 20th century, and I don't see what's stopping that from continuing to be the trend in the 21st century, is that they set the agenda. Regardless of any of the points Dan makes, they set the agenda, they've been setting the agenda, they decide what matters. Like, for example, the environment was not really an issue in the past. Yes, of course, we had Clean Air and Clean Water Acts and all that, but let's say in 1980, the candidates were not really talking about the environment. And then I remember in 1988 hearing Democrats saying, you know, the environment is going to become a major issue in American politics. And I remember thinking, what are you talking about? It's not even on anybody's radar. I mean, of course, we want to keep an eye on the environment, but it didn't seem to be a top priority of anybody. And then it became that because they demanded it. Or the gay marriage issue. Nobody was talking about gay marriage in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, the Clintons made absolutely clear how against it they were. The progressives made that their agenda, and they got it because they set the agenda. When was the last time non-progressives said, this issue is really, really important to me and to us, and we're going to insist that it happen, and we're going to channel the energies of every power sector in society, entertainment, academia, the business world, politics, everything. That never happens. That has never happened. That's impossible for that to happen. Incidentally, I, I guess people in the LGBT world are much more forgiving than I would be because when all of a sudden 
gay marriage became required. Like everyone had to believe it or you were a bigot and they were going to ruin your life like they did with that guy who um, I think he created the Firefox browser and he donated to something for a traditional marriage and they just ruined his life. When all of a sudden you had to favor it, and then, well, what do you know? Everybody is enthusiastically in favor of gay marriage. I don't think I would have been as forgiving as the LGBT lobby was, where all of a sudden it was, hey, it's great, everybody supports it. Yeah, well, having in effect a gun to their heads, (laughs) it didn't hurt, I suppose. I think I would have said, look, it's really super to have all you people on our side. That's really great. You know, I love to have a lot of people supporting me, but how come you weren't supporting me five or 10 years ago? And all of a sudden now, you are going out of your way and can't possibly do enough to alert the whole world how much you support me. I don't know. You don't really seem like a reliable person. (laughs) Sorry. You just did a 180 with no explanation. And now you want to condemn everybody who believes as you did just 10 minutes ago. Uh, I think I would be saying, I don't know. That doesn't seem like sincerity to me. Sorry. Just doesn't seem sincere to me. But as I say, I guess I'm not as forgiving as some people. Hey folks, just a quick break to thank our sponsor, BitTrust IRA. I know that like me, a lot of you are interested in cryptocurrency, and I know you wish you could get in a time machine and go back and buy up a lot of Bitcoin when it was dirt cheap, but the next best thing is to use Bitcoin to diversify your portfolio and add it to your retirement account. Well, how can you do that? BitTrust IRA is going to make that super easy for you. They help you seamlessly and securely add cryptocurrency to your portfolio. They store your private keys in nuclear bunkers with military-grade encryption. And BitTrust IRA has a 24-7 trading platform with no minimum investments and unlimited trades, plus a team to help guide you along the way if you have any questions. And they also offer the lowest trading fees in the industry. So go to bittrustira.com slash woods today to learn more. And for a limited time, BitTrust IRA is waiving the sign-up fee for Tom Woods Show listeners. That's a $50 value. That's bittrustira.com slash woods. B-I-T-T-R-U-S-T-I-R-A dot com slash woods. Second thing is I don't see how we back out of this where there are certain opinions that you cannot express without being viciously attacked and again, possibly having your life ruined. And it could be something as benign as, I don't think the lockdowns on balance did much good. I think if anything, they did a lot of bad. If people come back at me, but look at how many people died, I would say, well, that number is irrelevant because the point is, did these measures do anything to keep that number low? Did those measures do anything to prevent further deaths? And it it doesn't seem to have done that. Basically, it seems like we would have had the same number of deaths, but with much less damage to society. Those are the, it's not like the choice is between X number of deaths and zero deaths. The choice is between X number of deaths and X number of deaths. But in the first case, with society destroyed and people's livelihoods ruined and a slew of other unnoticed health problems, or X deaths with none of those things. But anyway, I'm I'm getting sidetracked. There are people who are afraid, people in healthcare, people in public health, who are afraid to speak openly about this because it was decided early on that the position that all the fashionable people were gonna take was that you gotta stay in your house and we're not gonna bother to see if this does any good. We're just gonna assume a priori that it must do some good. And we're going to lecture you and hector you and ruin your business and mob you with one-star reviews because you opened at 75% capacity instead of 63 or whatever. That's replicated on a variety of other issues, gender issues, transgender issues. And if you have any opinion other than the standard pieties you're expected to repeat about these issues, then no matter how many facts you have, no matter how many studies you have, no matter how much you have on your side, it does not matter. They want to destroy you. They want you to be submissive or dead. And I think most people find it very hard to stand up to that. So they keep their heads down and they stay quiet. And then they get to the ballot box and they vote the opposite way. But otherwise, they just keep their heads down. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to be hated by their peers. They don't want to be ostracized. How do we get out of that? I don't know. And it's progressivism that's driving that. So it could be that, yeah, the Democratic Party is sclerotic, but that doesn't necessarily mean that progressive ideas are going to go away or don't have a firm foundation. I think they have a shockingly firm foundation, unfortunately. And it's hard now to organize resistance to these ideas because 
if you resist a progressive, you're, of course, full of hate. That's the idea. So therefore, we can ban you. Even though these have to be the most deranged, hateful, destructive people I have ever seen. But you're the hater because you disagree with them. Moreover, let's look at Ron DeSantis's Florida. Even here, where people have mostly resisted the crazy lockdown nonsense to the extent that they could, and of course the governor has resisted it for the most part, they still voted for the $15 minimum wage, which goes to show they don't understand how wage rates are determined. They don't understand what an economic law is. And they think outcomes they prefer can simply be legislated into existence through threats of violence and that that's the way social life works, that you can override so-called economic laws by use of sheer will, which, by the way, is how every totalitarian in history has thought about the economy. I don't need your so-called economic laws. The force of my will is enough to overcome them. Okay, that's one way to look at the world, I suppose. Given how little people are taught about the economy, real economics, given the propaganda they get, in secondary school and college, I'm surprised it's taken this long to get to a point where people have just become completely unhinged from reality when it comes to economics. They want endless stimulus payments. They want endless debt. I'm surprised it took this long to get to this point. But this, this is where we are. And meanwhile, anybody who warns that there might be problems here, and this has happened, people who've just warned, I think this might be a little bit too much, have been savaged in the media. And then, of course, the question becomes, if progressivism really is a dying ideology, what replaces it? What coherent replacement exists out there? And we can certainly say, and I know Dan would agree with me, that conservatism, Inc. has not exactly given the country a coherent replacement. Who even knows what these people believe? My experience with the official organized conservative movement is that these are a lot of third-rate mediocrities on the take who have think tanks that exist for the purpose of continuing to exist, to fundraise so they can exist further, so they can fundraise further. In terms of of an attractive alternative to progressivism, they're all over the map. Yeah, we want this healthcare intervention, but not that 10% crazier one. Or we want 90% of the lockdown policy you want, or whatever it is, there's nothing attractive or original about it. There's nothing exciting about it. There seems to be no fixed principle involved. And not to mention progressivism dominates the way we think about history too. So even if it is dying, it it almost doesn't matter. It's done the damage that it could do. Even if it died tomorrow, it's done the damage it's set out to do. Because most Americans do look at American history through a progressive lens, which means it's almost hopeless to imagine that they'll ever draw the correct conclusions in the present. Because they think in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt rescued the country from the Great Depression, which was caused by capitalism. If you think that way, you are never, ever going to get things right. Never. If that's the way you look at the world, you're never going to get it right. So some of us fight back. I mean, I I wrote the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. That did very well. But there's only so much we can do. The official precincts of the conservative movement are occupied by people who can't stand the sight of you and me. So conservatism is hopeless at this point. And I say that as somebody with great sympathy for conservatism and who's learned a great deal from a great many conservative thinkers, but it's hopeless right now, what they're serving up. Now, as long as we're talking about history, I might mention that uh, just the other day, I mentioned this in my email newsletter, the most recent episode of the Politically Incorrect Guide animated series was just released. Michael Malice and I have a cartoon that we do together comes out once a month, and the most recent episode was a politically incorrect guide to communism. Now, you might think, well, communism, right? That's, that died a long time ago, but obviously some of the ideas persist. Nobody gets is particularly demonized for entertaining those ideas or for at least thinking that Marx was kind of chic. You know, being, being a Marxist is kind of chic in a way that being other kinds of totalitarian is not chic. And of course, when it comes to knowledge of the crimes of communism, it's shocking how little Americans know. When I used to teach college freshmen Western civilization, I don't know if I ever came across anybody who knew about what happened with the Ukrainians in the terror famine of the 1930s. 
I don't think any of them knew about that. And we're talking about millions of deaths engineered deliberately. I don't think any of them knew about that. And there's no particular urgency about making this kind of information known, whether in the entertainment world or elsewhere. I did an episode of the Tom Woods Show a long time ago in which I went through the amazing article written by Eugene Genovese, who was an ex-Marxist, a brilliant historian. And in 1994, in a periodical called Dissent, he wrote an article called The Question. And the question he had in mind was for his fellow travelers, what did you know and when did you know it? And the reference here is to the crimes of communism. And he knew full well, they all knew everything and they knew it at the time. And he just crushed them in this article. And yet nothing really happens to them. There are no repercussions. Because of the progressive bias in the history profession, we're taught that left-wing movements always have their hearts in the right place. They may be trying to get to their desired goal a little bit too quickly. So perhaps they can be gently scolded for that. But that's about as far as it goes. They're going to be portrayed in a rosy, sweet, little cutesy kind of way. And that's progressivism. And it seems to me to be everywhere. So it's possible what Dan's saying is true, but maybe he's conflating progressivism with the fortunes of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is indeed in upheaval. That's true. But so is the Republican Party. The Democrats have the advantage that the ideas that they at least give lip service to are taken for granted as simply obvious by a vast swath of the population and are repeated constantly from the mouths of most of the opinion molders in the country. That's a pretty big advantage to have. All right, folks, before we go, I want you to know about a listener named Ross Tickner, T-I-C-K-N-O-R. He's an audiobook narrator, and he's heard me say that most audiobook narrators sound like they're reading the instructions for operating a microwave oven. And if you've listened to a lot of audiobooks, you know what I'm talking about. And I've had some of my books read that way, and it makes me crazy. So he thought to himself, well, I bet I could read a book better than somebody who reads it like it's the instruction manual for a microwave oven. So he started to do not only podcasting, but audiobook production. And so the most recent one he did was for a book featured on Dave Smith's Part of the Problem podcast called Status Schmo, One Man Against the Status Quo by Burt Walker. And he says he just loves the book. He knew he had to produce the audiobook, So he went ahead and did it. So if you like audiobooks, but man, you know what I'm talking about. It is just like a drone reading them to you then you might want to check out Ross's website where you can listen to him read books for you. And that's rosstichnervoice.com. R-O-S-S-T-I-C-K-N-O-R voice.com. I'm going to link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1880. And I thank Ross for using my link to get his web hosting for that website. And if you do that for the site you're thinking of creating, I'll promote your site get you in my private bloggers group where you can get help when you need it, and I'll send you some tutorials to get you up and running super quickly. All these are free bonuses. All you gotta do is just get your hosting through my link. Details for how to do that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.